John Hancock, and I am the Executive Director of Ministry at Faith Fellowship Church, here to bring our Wednesday night teaching. And as usual, we're going to be in Psalms, so if you have your Bibles, please go ahead and open them up to Psalm 150, which if you're keeping track, that is the last Psalm in the book of Psalms. And so please uh, get your Bible on your laps, if you will, and uh, read through this uh, with me as we go. It So uh, Psalm 150. Uh, verses 1 through 6 is a very short psalm, but it's full of praise, and I think we're going to enjoy this together. So um, <clears throat> starting in verse 1, it says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals, and praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, let's go back and start going through this one verse at a time. Um, for verse one, it's pretty simple. It says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. 
simply praising the Lord. Now, we looked at that phrase last week. If you tuned into last week's teaching, it means to shine. That's what the Greek is there. It's kind of just saying to shine. Uh, we won't go over that whole thing again this week, but we would do well to remember to deflect glory to God. That is an important thing for us to do. When people throw praises our direction, we should deflect them uh, and say praise God for what he has done, not what we have. Now, this psalm particularly is about the praise that is stirred up in our hearts when our hearts are overflowing with joy and peace in the spirit. Now, sanctuary is a word that's used right there. Of course, I'm reading out of the ESV, so I'm not sure uh, if yours uses the word sanctuary or not, but what we're looking at here is not necessarily a physical um, auditorium, if you will. Um, it might seem like the word sanctuary there will come out of the, the room that we would call an auditorium uh, and that we, would, we must go to this physical location and praise him there. Or you might look at it in terms of the sanctuary in the temple. Uh, which, of course, is now destroyed. But back in this uh, time when the psalm was written, it was people would go to what you would think it would be called the sanctuary inside the temple um, to praise him. Now, if that's the case, uh, we need to praise him in the destroyed temple, and we can't do that either. So, so how are we to come and praise him in his mighty heavens? Uh, at the second part of that verse, how are we supposed to do that? And we can't, we can't go right now to his mighty heavens and praise him there. That's not something we can do either. So this, this ongoing encouragement though that we read about to praise the Lord needs to happen now. And it needs to happen kind of going forward. Now you might be surprised to learn that sanctuary in this case is well translated to sacredness, apartness, holiness, and consecrated. So let's take a a look at this with a little better lens of understanding what that word sanctuary is translating to. So when we say praise God in his sanctuary, what we're saying is praise God in his sacredness, praise God in his holiness, praise God in his apartness. That's not a place so much as it is an attribute uh, on who he is. But his attribute of holiness is not found in the dark or in any place where his light is not welcome and sin is enjoyed and sin is approved. That is not where you find this, this holiness, this set-apartness, if you will. A little more uh, insight actually comes when you see the second part of verse 1, where again it reads, Praise him in his mighty heavens. Now some translations will say in his mighty firmament meaning an extended or an expanded surface or an expanse, if you will, a, a large area. Uh, most references in the Bible to this word that we find in the Greek are about the expanse of heaven. Uh, now you find it sometimes in the, in the creation story uh, of Genesis 1 when it talks about the expanse and how he created the heavens, how he created the earth and these large expanses of space. Uh, but you also see it in Ezekiel's vision of the glory of the Lord. You can read about that in Ezekiel chapter 1, and I highly recommend that you do. But you also see it, this, this idea of firmament, of, of expanse, about praising him in the expanse and in the firmament in Daniel chapter 12, which if you're familiar with the last chapter, Daniel, it is where the end times are talked about. Um, so now bear in mind, of course, that, that, that this entire psalm was written maybe and intended for the Levites uh, in the, as a call to worship, life, very similar to what we'll do in, in services these days. The, the song that we have is a call to worship where we're stirring up the hearts of the worshipers uh, to praise the Lord. So this is what was going on back here when it was written for the Levites at this particular time. It was literally a call to worship for them. But it reaches not only to the Levites of that day, but it reaches through all these years, all these centuries, and calls us to worship as well. We are to praise him in the heavens. We are to praise him in his holiness. We are to praise him in all places, in all aspects, in all areas of our lives. There is no area in our life where we can exclude praise to God. So verse 2 says here, it says, Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. All right, so praise him, you know, still 
still praise him now like they did back in uh, the Levites' day. Praise him still for his strength and for his might, for his deeds, the mighty works that he has already done and what he is currently doing. See, there is no exclusion here for the past deeds or present deeds or future deeds. Is I mean, is there anything that you know of in, in all of the world that that is not worthy of praise when it comes to what God does? Are not all things that God does worthy of this praise? Every deed, everything he does is mighty because he is a mighty God. Have you ever seen a mighty person do anything unmighty? You just don't see that. Um, now this it seems like an easy question to answer, right? That there's everything that God does is, is, is worthy of our praise and worthy of, our, of glorifying him. It seems such like an easy question to answer until you consider all the things that God has done. See, not just his strength in deliverance, not just his sovereignty over life and death, the things that we love to praise him for now, but also his rule and his sovereignty over trials and tribulations too. Now, his mighty deeds do include sovereignty over difficult circumstances, including, I hate to say it, suffering and hardship. Romans 5, 3 through 5, this is a passage you might be very familiar with. This is one of our memory verses not too long ago. It says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that suffering, you can say it with me, it produces endurance. Endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. It does not. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So there we go, suffering to endurance, endurance to character, and character to hope. And that hope never puts us to shame. Now, we ought to be familiar with that verse uh, because God's mighty deeds are not just deliverance from that storm of life. Right? We like to see that as a mighty deed that he's done. He pulled me out of the mud of the mire. He saved me from my sin. These mighty deeds that we love to extol and, to, and, and the virtues that we praise him uh, for were... God's mighty deeds are not just deliverance from that storm and from that sin and from that issue or that difficulty, but his mighty deeds also include the sustenance and the peace within that storm. Now let that sink in for a second. While we're in the storm, one of my favorite uh, passages really is, is, is how Jesus is sleeping in the boat and uh, there's the middle of the storm that's going on and you get a great picture of what this looks like in the life of a believer who may or may not be or probably is going through some storm or some trial some tribulation in their life some difficulty uh, and yet you can see them sleeping peacefully when it's time to rest when it's time to sleep just like jesus did uh, the disciples literally had to wake him up no matter where he was at he was woken up at this point and then of course he calmed uh, the storm. And so we, they look at the storm, the calming of the storm is the mighty deed. And I, I see the mighty deed as Jesus being able to sleep while he's in the boat in the middle of that storm. I think you can too. What a mighty deed it would be that no matter what's going on in our life, we're able to sleep, we're able to rest in God and have that peace and have that sustenance. I mean, perhaps it's even mightier what God does in our hearts, in calming our spirits with the word of God, rather than the taming of the actual tempest. The wind and the waves, they must obey him. They have to obey him. We, sadly, can choose not to. Shall we praise him for the deliverance? Yes. Shall we praise him for the suffering? Yes, again. Verse 3. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Well, absolutely, says the musician. Yes, I think we all know what a trumpet is, right? But do you know what a lute is? Well, according to Strong's Concordance, it is a skin, bottle, jar, or pitcher. Apparently, I guess, and this is, comes as a surprise to me as well, Americans aren't the first ones to discover what happens when you blow on the top of a bottle. You blow on the bottle and out comes this little this sound. It's, it's like what they would have done with a lute. That's the kind of same similar instrument. So they've, they've been doing this 
uh, for a long, long time blowing on the top of bottles. You know, of course, you can put a lot of water in there up to a certain level, and you'll change the pitch. Uh, you'll change the the entire sound of what comes out of that bottle depending on the size of it, the skinny, the the side the up and down, how much liquid you can put in there. Um, I, I think I've even seen a video one time of somebody uh, literally playing a whole bunch of different bottles, if you will. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. That's what a lute is, okay? Uh, it's amazing, but it's it's often this idea of a lute is often paired up uh, with a with a harp in, in God's word. Now, perhaps the original uh, garage bands were a little different than they are now. Uh, but let's see what else we can praise him with besides the lute and the harp. Uh, it says in verse 4, it says, Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. See, not only shall we praise him with our modern day versions of the trumpet, the lute, and the harp, but we also get to praise him with the tambourine, the strings, and the pipe. Now, this is indeed a good word. Now, we have used tambourines on occasion here at this church. We have also used stringed instruments. We use those an awful lot. We use guitars. We use violins. Uh, we have cellos. Uh, I don't know if you realize it, but even the piano is a stringed instrument, uh, if you dare to look inside it, that is. Now, we don't have any pipes, per se, but we could. Now, that would be a flute or maybe a saxophone, a clarinet, maybe even a bassoon or an oboe. Uh, they're they're, they're the, these wind instruments, if you will, that you can open and close openings on them and change the, the noise and, and, the, and the notes that are coming out of it. Uh, some churches even have the pipe organs. So, you know, when you read God's Word and you say pipe, uh, it could be include the organs because it's using air uh, to move through the instrument now. So, well, what about not just those things that we all agree that we can use and see? What about those noisy things? You know, the drums, uh, do we have to keep those? Are they actually named in this passage? Well, let's check out verse 5, and we may see that the case. It says in verse 5, it says, Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing symbols. Now, this just kind of makes me smile. Uh, the whole passage kind of really does, but this just a little bit more. Now, I know it doesn't specifically say cymbals and bass drum and toms and snare or even the cowbell, which, of course, we all need more cowbell. But what actually gets me grinning is praising him with loud clashing cymbals. I mean, this is no excuse to damage our hearing, but the idea is an exuberant loud sound, like a report, if you will. We, we call that the report of a rifle. It's a sound that's sharp and, and, it, and it focuses, if you will. We all like volume. I don't know if this is something that uh, people would tend to want to argue about, but I can, I can say we all like volume until it's something we don't like to listen to or it's something that we don't like to hear. For instance, uh, I'm more likely to turn up uh, in volume Chris Tomlin or Mercy Me uh, than I am Lecrae. Now, those are all good artists that praise Jesus, but not all of them are my preferred style of music. So I can tell you the things I get excited about, I tend to turn up, and the things that I'm not as excited about, I might turn down a little bit. So it, it's just this, this idea that we don't like loud things. Yes, at some point it can hurt the hearing. And when it hurts the hearing, yeah, let's be honest with it. Let's not, let's not do any damage. I don't think that's the idea here. Uh, but when we uh, we all like the things that we like, and we tend to like them a little bit louder than other people. So it just tells me that, yes, we do like loud things. And, and in God's word, literally, it says, praise him with loud uh, clashing cymbals. Okay, so we but we can praise Jesus uh, with all kinds of instruments. Okay, we can also praise him without. Okay, we can praise him in prayer, in studying God's word, uh, in giving, in discipling other people, in sharing um, our faith, and uh, really one of the ones I like is encouraging others. That is a praise to God when we encourage others and spur each other on to uh, good works and, and good deeds. Uh, that is praise to God. That's what we are doing. Uh, but the verses that we're studying today uh, they, they may not be exclusive, but they do show us many ways to exalt his holy name in 
using instruments. So maybe you even caught something uh, found in today's passages that I didn't actually mention, that I haven't expounded upon. But it's right there in verse 4, and let's not skip it, okay? It's just not an instrument per se. It says in verse 4 again, it says, Praise him with tambourines and dance. Yeah, praise him with strings and pipe. It's that word dance. Yes, praise him with dance. Uh, this is like the old church joke, it seems like, around here. This is that we're going to do... Uh, we're going to have some interpretive dance, or we're going to have some sort of dance thing as part of our worship service. Uh, and it's kind of understood that this is kind of, well, maybe that's not really acceptable. Maybe it really is. I don't know. We don't really do it a lot. Um, so what what is it saying here? It says, praise him with tambourine and dance. Yes, praise him with dance. This is an area that, that tends to draw a lot of disapproval, I guess, is what you're, I guess, hearing here. Uh, from a lot of the body of Christ. Uh, you're not hearing it from me, but you're hearing that it is often frowned upon, okay? Yet here it is in verse 4. I mean, did David not dance before the Lord? And um, he did it in exuberance. It was, it, was, it was something that he did. And yet here we also see in Psalm 150 that we're called uh, to praise him and dance. And so so why, why is dance frowned upon? Uh, by a lot of churches. Now, I think the answer is a little more simple than you might think. And it's actually the same exact reason why instrumentation is often rejected. Okay, The important pieces of these verses are not the nouns. Okay, The nouns being dance, strings, pipe, tambourine, harp, lute, trumpet. Okay, Those are not the important parts of the verses. Those are just the nouns. Okay, The critical component is praise him. When any band, individual, or group of people dances or plays, sings, or performs to draw attention to themselves, they have completely missed the intent within the framework of this passage and with the framework of a Christian life. Frankly, they have missed the entirety of the gospel and the purpose for why Jesus came. Psalm 115.1 says this, Not to us, O Lord, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Now, I can't help but notice that most dancing, I just say most of it, all right, not all, but most dancing is a cry for attention and not a gift unto God. I've seen, and you've seen beautiful dancing, and I've seen self-centered, look at me kind of dancing. It's not even close to the same thing. But I've also heard and seen musicians that draw me into worship, but I've also seen and heard musicians that wow me with pyrotechnics, lights, fog machines. What's missing? Maybe it's humility. Humility is often missing in the presentation of praise. Now, that's an interesting statement. It's an interesting phrase. It's, it's funny even because it's, it's not funny. Okay? Presentation of praise is not the biblical truth. Praise to God is what we must hang on to. A heart of worship and a life of praise poured out into service to our King, Jesus Christ. So that the last verse we see today is the physical manifestation of this entire passage. And just as important, it says in verse 6, and this is what we're ending with, it says, let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I've got breath. You've got breath. Let's use it to praise the Lord and not bring attention to ourselves. Amen? Amen. Have a fantastic Wednesday.